Hello, Kai Smith. Welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? I'm doing great. And you? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. You are coming from all the way across the world. Tell us where you are. Mm -hmm. I'm in Friesland, the Netherlands. So in the most northern part of the Netherlands. The northern part of the Netherlands. You're the first guest I've had from the Netherlands. Your story is so powerful. I can't wait for people to hear how much you have overcome in your life. So before we get into the story, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing these days? I am pursuing a public speaking career because I want to motivate and inspire people with the upcoming story that you're that you're going to hear and going to listen to. And I want to help people realize how precious life is and how mentally you can change everything if you just really want it and really dare to take the next step. Well, Kai, I have no doubt at all that you're going to inspire so many people with your story. So tell us, when did all of this start for you? Uh, it started on the 12th of May, the evening of the 12th of May, that we actually have security cameras around my house on which you can see me walk to the garage, fully uh, enjoying life, flailing my arms around, swimming, swinging them around, like there's nothing, no care in the world. And then a half an hour later, you see me walking back with my hands on my head, with my hands in front of my body because I was scared to bump into stuff. You can see me avoid the the uh, fireplace. And that's when I knew, okay, this isn't right. So What year was that, Kai? Uh, 2021. Okay, so just a year ago. Just a year ago, yeah. yeah. And what happened next? Uh, what happened next was I went inside. <clears throat> I knew something was was wrong because I had a, I've had a headache before, but this one was huge. It was killing. So and I couldn't see stuff. So I thought, okay, this isn't normal. And but I thought I was over exerting my body because I was studying from eight a.m. until eight p.m. for my exams to get into sure. university. So I thought, okay, I'm just overdoing it. I'm just exhausted just need to take some rest and it will, it'll be fine so i went inside i sat on the couch i told my parents because they were both home god thank god mm -hmm. and uh i told them okay i have a huge headache it's not better it's not getting better anymore it's only getting worse and uh mom if you stand to the right of me i can't see you if you stand to the left of me i can't see you so i'm losing vision in my right eye Mm. they knew imagine something as a mom hearing my son tell me something like that yeah it was it was horrible but uh, my parents didn't panic my neighbor is a doctor so they called him he went came over did some tests did every test for every possible scenario there was and his conclusion was migraine mm. i had a migraine according to his tests be, that's perfectly normal because, well, I've had two cerebral hemorrhages, and that that, that was the cause for the headache. Mm. And he did even did the test for cerebral hemorrhages, but it didn't came out as cerebral hemorrhage. It came out for okay, you don't have uh, paralysis in your face or in your muscles. You don't have a speaking disorder, and you can think properly. Those were, and you don't have a tintling sensation in your limbs. So the tintling sensations face paralysis, and uh, speaking speaking disorder. Those are the three things you look for when you have brain hemorrhage. Okay, but I didn't have any sure of we those. say those again. I want people to have those very clearly. So tingling yeah. sensations, in your limbs, para yeah. face paralysis, and, and what was the third one? Uh, speech, in, uh, in, impaired speech. Impaired speech, facial paralysis, and tingling sensations. Okay, those yeah, are three it's, hugely it's, important things to look for. It's not only face paralysis, it's probably paralysis in your limbs. So you can't move your your left arm or right arm. You can't move your leg anymore. Mm. But you mostly see it also in the face where your left side of your face or your right side of your face is hanging down as if it's paralyzed. Yeah. So that's something you should look for. And uh, what most people tell me, and I've heard this before, is that when someone has brain hemorrhage, they 
tend to have a huge headache. Like someone, one that's incomparable to anything you've suffered before. It's mm. killing. You want to scream it out from agony. And that's what I did because the, the doctor came and said, okay, you have a migraine. Go upstairs, get some rest. It's going to get better. If I had done that, I would have been dead. Mm. Because it, it, it was everywhere. The blood was everywhere. So what did you do? Uh, I laid down on the floor because I had fever symptoms. So I was very warm because my head was pounding and pounding. So my mother tried to close the curtains and we have those rattling curtains with balls. So mm -hmm. metal balls and you, it makes rattling sound. But I was screaming in agony when she pulled down those curtains. I said, stop, please stop. Because it was hurting so much. Eventually, then it went it suddenly went black, for me at least. Mm. Uh, my parents told me I had an epileptic attack. They called the emergency services. They came. I was rushed to the hospital. The surgeon was flown in by helicopter, and I was performed an er emergency surgery on my head. Oh, my goodness. And at that time, I was told, my parents were told, I had a 5% chance of surviving the night. 5%? And a 95% chance of being brain dead. Mm. My first so, chance of surviving the night. Those aren't good yeah, odds. Those aren't good odds, no. And then you have, if you, if I did survive the, get the 5% chance and survive the night, I would have to beat another 95% chance of being brain dead. Oh my goodness. So let's put some math into this. It would be a 0.25% chance that I would even survive and be able to think properly. Mm. So what's the next thing you remember? Uh, the 16th of June, July. So from the 12th of May until the 16th of July, I can't remember anything. Oh my goodness, that's two months. That's two months indeed. And uh, for me it was mere seconds. Yeah. So everything went black. I woke up, I couldn't speak, couldn't walk, couldn't, uh, didn't know anything and didn't know where I was. Could and you I, be? I could see. That was also one of the things the, the doctor told me. He's going to be brain dead and he's going to be blind. But you woke up. You could yeah. see, but you couldn't I move. I could see. I couldn't move, couldn't speak. Wow. I was, what you call in medical terms, I was locked in. Mm. So because I was, I, um, Then it's a little hazy for me because those first six weeks were... Uh, Everything is mushed together. Sure. On Tuesday to because my my memory was very hazy and very bad because well I had severe brain damage. Yeah. And uh, when I woke up, I thought this was all a dream. Now when I c could speak again, and they told me yeah you had a brain hemorrhage, I didn't believe them. I thought okay, you are surely joking. I am an eighteen year old kid. This only happens to very elderly people who are in poor health. I was in perfect health. I worked out four to six times a week didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't do drugs. Why am I here? Mm. So I thought, okay, only solution, I, this is a dream. But the dream didn't stop. The dream didn't stop, no. Have you ever seen the movie Inception? I have not. You have not? Okay, you should put that definitely on your bucket list. I Especially after this story, because it's very relatable to the story. For any listeners who haven't, watched Inception yet it's a movie about Leonardo DiCaprio who enters someone else's dream and mm. he has a spinning uh, a wooden spinner I don't call it I only know the Dutch word but uh, it's not a top uh, that's what it's called so and uh, that's how he knows that he's in a dream or when he isn't if the if the top keeps spinning he's in a dream if he falls over he's out of the dream but he has a wife in the movie his wife also has such a safety device, but she doesn't believe it anymore. She thinks she's still in the, in the dream when she's left the dream. Her only solution, and the one she eventually decides to take, is to take her own life. Oh my goodness. And that was what my solution was as well. After I had done, I've, I ran some tests, of course. I didn't go straight away to suicide. I was very optimistic and I thought, okay, let's think of this logically. We are an 18-year-old kid. We... And this was to myself. So we are an 18-year-old kid. We worked out four to six times a week. We're very healthy. Didn't do drugs. Didn't smoke. Didn't drink alcohol. 
How is this possible? Let's let's can we remember can we remember a full week? No, we can't. Okay, let's remember a full week. Okay, let's remember what kind of therapy we did this week. I remembered everything. Nothing changed. Let's remember every name of every nurse. I did that. Nothing changed. I was actually looking forward to sleeping. I slept, let's say, uh, 16 hours in a day, something like that. Because my hope, I hoped that when I woke up after dreaming, that I would wake up in my normal bed that's behind me and just be able to walk again, speak again, be able to do everything again. But it didn't happen. So that's when I, that, at that moment, I could speak again. And the first, one of the first things I asked my mother was, Mom, can you get me a gun? Because I don't want to continue anymore. After she had just gotten her son back, because I defied all the odds of even being able to see, not being brain dead and not being dead. And one of the first things I asked her was to get me a gun. And I'm sure she said no. She said, give me three months. Yeah. If you still want to continue after three months, I'll get you a gun. Because I was a happy-go-lucky guy. I was on the, on the doorstep of a new life. I was about to enter university. I would have passed my high school exams with flying colors. My school sets as well. And then it all changed. All my friends went to university. Every, some, went to, to, uh, some went to other countries. Some made a world tour. Some went traveling everywhere. Some took a gap year and went to, to, went to work everywhere. And I was there in a heavy-duty uh, wheelchair with headrest, uh, with a with a, a kind of uh, what is it called? Uh, was it a halo that would hold your head? Yeah, so something that would hold my head up because I tended to collapse in front mm -hmm. because I couldn't move. I couldn't hold my head up. It was too heavy. So then, so, what happened? Um. What had helped me was because I, I used to speak to a psychologist uh, five times a week or yeah, five times a week, every day a rehabilitation center was open. I would speak to a psychologist. Mm -hmm. Nothing worked. Everything she said, I was just like, yeah, yeah, I'm in a dream. Everything you say is not real. This is my unconscious speaking. Yeah. Because uh, I suffered from short-term memory loss. Maybe you've mm -hmm. heard this sentence before from the Finding Nemo movies with Dory. Mm -hmm. That... Yes. Um, well, I suffered from the same because when I put my phone to the right of me, I closed my eyes. It was suddenly on uh, on, a, on the stand, on the nightstand, or it was to the left of me. And I couldn't remember why it went there or how it got there. So I thought, okay, it teleported because I didn't remember doing it myself. And when I was asleep, so someone else would should have done it. But I didn't think of that possibility. Sure. So I thought, okay, it's teleporting. This has to be a dream. I ran some tests. I thought, okay, I'm healthy. And one of the main things was I could predict everything the nurses did. If I'd asked them, can you get me some water? They say, yeah, yeah, in five minutes, I'm, I'm busy. So every time I asked them, they said, yeah, yeah, I'm busy, five minutes. So I thought, okay, this has to be fake. This has to be a dream. Until three things, actually. First, medication that I got, don't remember the name, but it, it's uh, amantadine. That's what it's called in Dutch. So it's probably amantadine or something in, in, in English. But it's a, it's a medication that makes you conscious, that, that boosts your consciousness. Mm -hmm. So when someone is in a, in a sort of a trance or a coma, coma state that I was in, the medication helps them to wake up and to realize this is real. So that's one of the things. Mm -hmm. The other thing was uh, talking to my friends again. Because mm -hmm. uh, I could predict everything my parents said, my the nurses said, my therapist said. I could predict everything. Because it was also standard. It, uh, it was also normal. Sure. If I asked them, okay, uh, what are we going to do today? Yeah, we're going to try to walk again. Okay, what are we going to do today? Yeah, we're going to play Rainworms. That was a game in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, yeah, well, same old shit every day. Mm. Sorry, my language. And when I when I could move my right arm again, I 
texted my friends and I texted them, hey guys, how are you doing? I expected an answer like, hey guy, how are you doing? But I got an answer back like, holy shit guy, how are you still alive? Yeah. How are you? Where have you been? Can you move anything? That was the reaction I got. I thought, okay, whoa. I didn't Maybe expect this. this is real. I thought, okay, that's not something my subconscious could predict or could think of. So mm-hmm. I texted with them more often and more often. And they all came with responses I didn't predict. And I couldn't have predicted in my wildest dreams. So I thought, okay, maybe this is real. But the deciding factor was when a friend of the family came by. He heard, he heard, from my, he heard of my situation. And um, let's call him Bob. Bob had an accident. Had a, he told me he had a stroke when he was 14 in Canada. Okay, that's not and something you could have come up with on your own. No, not something I could have come up with, even though, especially when I saw him. But he told me, okay, I had the exact same th- thoughts you had. I thought it was all, this was all a dream as well. And he told me that when he got back to the Netherlands, that he knew, okay, I'm now in a familiar place, or I'm now back to where I was. This has to be real. So, mm-hmm. and when I saw him, I thought, holy damn. How is he so normal? Because he, he walked normal, he spoke normal, he moved normal. Nothing was weird about him. So I thought, okay, this has to be a miracle. Then he told me, okay, I if you, you know this is real, right? I said, I'm not sure yet. Okay, I'm going to send you a card. I said, yeah, could you send on the card? Could you put on the card? Kai, this isn't a dream. This is real. Uh, X Bob. So a week later, I received the card. I know, okay, this has to be real. Then uh, he told me that told me that I had to kind of yeah. change things for you. You went from yeah. not even really sure if you were experiencing reality or a dream mm-hmm. to yeah. okay, this is real. And then I yeah. imagine a, a ton of feelings would come along with that. That oh, this is real. But well, then you see this it, guy who experienced the same thing, and he's standing there and walking and talking and. There had to be so many emotions you were experiencing all at once. Um, disbelief. And I thought he was lying. So I, the first, first, it's mostly the, the second thing that made me realize that it wasn't a dream. And that's, uh, I was in a rehabilitation center in the northern part of the Netherlands, which was a normal rehabilitation center with a youth department and an elderly department. Mm-hmm. I was on, in the youth department, but it wasn't specialized in brain damage. And my parents wanted me to go to Dan Theus Centrum. Dan Theus is a name of a patient, which was named, uh, the center, the rehabilitation center was named after him because it was founded by his dad. And uh, it's specialized in brain, in not born with brain damage. So my parents wanted me to go there. And I mm-hmm. heard this name come by, come around a few times in the, in the past week, in the last week. So I thought, okay, this has to be fake. I'm not seeing anything. I'm not going anywhere. It has to be fake. So eventually I did go to the Dan Theo Center. And I remembered, okay, I can't predict what my friend said. I couldn't predict that Lars would come by. I'm going someplace else. Just like Lars said, uh, just like Bob said, this has to be real. So I I got two things from Bob. One, a method to know if, if this was a dream or not. And two, motivation to keep going because I knew it was possible. He was very optimistic at that moment because uh, as I came to realize and as I've come to realize right now, every brain damage is different. Nothing is the same. That even though he had a stroke and he he uh, he was very young, he could walk again in two weeks. It took me six months to walk again. Mm. So I was in a far worse off place than he was. I just didn't think of it. I thought, okay, he did it. I could do it same. Sure. I would imagine that youthful optimism would have been, was helpful at that point in time too. It was very helpful, yeah. yeah. So here we are a year and a month later mm-hmm. from when this happened. You said it happened May 12th in 2021, and we're recording mm-hmm. this on June 1st in 2022. And yeah. I look at you and I see the young man that yeah. I wouldn't suspect had any kind of issue, let alone one that he had 5% chance odds of surviving. 
and that had you paralyzed in yeah. a vegetative state for that mm -hmm. period of time. I mean, that's truly amazing. You're a miracle, Kai. I know. It may sound selfish, but I know I'm a walking miracle at this moment. Yeah. And that you would choose to share that with people. That's really brave. Mm -hmm. Because you could be someone's Bob. You could be the one that would walk into someone's room and give them a lifeline to know what is real and to give them hope again. Yeah. But it could also help people who who help those in need understand what it feels like to be in need and to mm -hmm. give them a clear perspective on why you need to help them or why you need to show compassion or why you need to treat them like a normal person. Because that's something that nurses and therapists and people around you stop doing. That's treating you like a normal person. They treat you like you're an infant. Mm -hmm. And some may be an infant, but some aren't. And some are very capable of thinking on their own. And that's very frustrating to be treated like an infant. Sure. That's a great insight. What other mm -hmm. plans do you have? Um, well, I'm planning on continuing my speaking career because I want to motivate people and inspire people with the lessons I've learned with my method. And just to give them an insight on what it's like to be at the end of your life, just to want to end it, just to want to end it all and mm -hmm. what it takes for you to come back. And the mental power that it had to, that it had cost me to be able to get back. I would imagine that was immense. It was immense, yeah. Well, Kai, we're sitting here across the world talking to each other. Mm -hmm. You're 19 years old. You're speaking to me in a foreign language, a language that yeah. is not native to you. No. Nope. After having such a severe brain trauma to the point where they didn't even know if you would live through the night. And here you are. You're not just getting by, but you are thriving. You are living. You're doing an interview a year later in a different language than what you know. I mean, that's powerful. That's inspiring. And to go from the depths where you were wanting to take your life to where you are now, I just want to stand and give you a standing ovation. I mean, you're tremendous. Thank you. What would you say to someone who's in that dark place? Um, well, I've, I have actually a very, uh, that someone in my rehabilitation center is, I don't know if she's still in the dark place, but I tried my best to get her out of it. I, I tried to be someone's Bob and I tried to be everyone's Bob at my rehabilitation center because I, I, no, I didn't improve for six months. I, it was a, it was a miracle that I could, can even move my left arm again because my therapists were sh were telling me, "Okay, guy, you're not improving much. This isn't going to work. Just give up." Mm. I didn't give up. Good for you. But uh, some people do want to give up because they're in the situation for too long, or they don't see the end, the light at the end of the tunnel. And they just want to give up. So I've spoken to, let's call her Carla. I've spoken to Carla and she thought this was all a dream. Uh, she tells me she still thinks it's a dream, but it's less often than she used to. And that's because I talked to her. I gave her my insight. and she became, Because she was already in my rehabilitation center for not born with brain damage. Yeah. So she couldn't move from one rehabilitation center to the other. Mm -hmm. And she was already in her kind of bubble. So mm -hmm. I gave her my uh, self-found uh, method, which was contacting people. Mm -hmm. Because I said to her, you can predict everything that's happening, right? She said, yeah, I can. Okay, go talk to your friends. They're, they'll surprise you. I'll assure, I'll assure you. So she did that. and But uh, she... No, wait, wait, let's sketch the situation, okay? 20 mm -hmm. therapists, 20 rehabil rehabilitation, uh, 20 patients, 20 nurses, 60 people in total. Mm -hmm. I was uh, not clinical anymore, so I was rehabilitating from my apartment and going to the rehabilitation center 
during the day and going back to my apartment in the night she was still in the uh, in the in the hospital mm -hmm. so she was in a real bubble you don't have contact with the outside world you only talk to to patients and to nurses and to therapists mm -hmm. but um so i gave her the, the advice for okay go talk to people so that's what she did and her mother came came by and came to me and she said thank you kai i don't know what she did but thank you mm -hmm. carla has changed immensely i see the old carla again and i'm so happy that just broke me hmm. it just it made me feel so good that i know and that i knew okay i'm improving someone i'm helping someone and they made tremendous steps off there they made a tremendous improvement because they were positive again they saw okay i'll be able to make it they didn't think in that dark and didn't stay in a dark place anymore so being able to help someone that's very close to me, be able to improve so much, I just made my day, made my year. It's amazing. And you're only getting started. Yeah. and But the, the truly heartbreaking stuff was that she invited me to cook with her because she was still on the, that you need food through a nostril mm -hmm. and that you uh, have it pumped into your stomach. Yeah. So, and she was actually getting started with eating again because after you, uh, have brain damage and need to start learning how to eat again. You need to start learning how to swallow again. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're going to uh, it's not going to go well. Suffocate. It's not going to go well. You're going to suffocate. So she was improving on that, and she invited me. Okay, Kai, for for therapy, that's every basic uh, need that you're ever going to need. Uh, I need to cook. I need to make myself dinner. Do you want to cook dinner with me? I said, Yeah, let's go, Carla. I'm all in. So, uh, that's, uh, so she and I talked and I thought, I, I asked her because I was staying in my apartment and I wasn't in the hospital anymore. I thought, Hey, how is the hospital? Is it fun there? He said, are you getting along with people? She told me, no. I said, why not? I said, I don't talk, talk to anyone. I said, why not? You talk to me. Yeah, but you're the only one I talked to. Out of 60 people, I was the only one I could talk to. And I only talked to her th uh, through DMs on Instagram. Mm. Because she and I saw each other in the hallways like twice and we talked mm -hmm. for five minutes. So, and she, at the time she didn't go home. So she stayed in the hospital seven days a week. She mm -hmm. didn't talk to anyone except for me. That broke me. Yeah. So Kai, have you written a book yet? Uh, I am thinking about it. Yeah. 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 Put me down on the list. As soon as you get that written, I want a copy. That's okay. Have you talked to anyone about your movie yet? Or maybe that'll about come after your book. About my movie yet, yeah. It could be, it could be. Yeah. I want to be played by Leonardo DiCaprio. So the, no, the young version of Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm sure that can happen. If he hears your story, I would imagine he'd make it happen. I know, okay, yeah. you've inspired me. And I know you're going to inspire so many people. And anyone that wants to connect with you, they can find you on LinkedIn and at your website. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell us what those are. And I'm going to have those in the show notes so people can just click on those and find you. My website is kajsmit.com. So kaismit.com. And my LinkedIn is kaj space smit. Perfect. So folks, make sure you connect with this young man. He's inspiring and Maybe there's some way you can be a part of helping him get his story out to others and inspire so many people too. So Kai, I want to thank you again for being a guest on the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. And hopefully we'll have you back again someday and catch up with you and see what you're up to. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. You have any last words of inspiration? Uh, yeah, and that's one of the lessons I want to teach. That's if you have an end goal, don't look at the end goal. Look at where you started. That way you can see the improvements you made. Otherwise, it's an endless goal. Wise words. Mark your progress. All right. Thank you, Kai.